Okay, everyone. Good to be here. I hope you'll enjoy this series of studies on progressive revelation. And for this first talk, I've chosen the title Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I query that and say, really? Uh, why, why do I say that? Well, let's go on to the next slide, please. Number two. Okay, I have written this book on progressive revelation, and some of you read it and made nice comments. That's very kind of you. But, you know, I often take services in the Anglican Church, and in some of the services there, they have, when they have three readings, the first one is from the Old Testament, the second is from the epistles or the letters, and the third is from the Gospels. Uh, but that's not really in chronological order, is it? Mm -hmm. um, does that really matter? Yeah. Uh, well, I think it does matter, and I'll explain why uh, a bit today. But why do they do that? Well, obviously they do that because they want to honour Jesus. And we all want to honour our Lord Jesus Christ, don't we? You know, as simple as that. And so much so that in some churches, um, they people sit down for the Old Testament and the reading from the epistles and letters, and they stand up for the Gospels. In others, the Gospels are even taken down into the body of the church and read from there. Um, but, uh, you know, what about the risen the Lord Jesus Christ? What about the ascended Lord Jesus Christ and what he has to say? Um, if you do it in that order, you're almost saying the Jesus when he was on earth um, was more important than the Jesus who was raised from the dead, ascended in heaven, and is seated at God's right hand. But anyway, let's go on. Number three, please. So this is the passage which has this very famous quote. It's from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 to 8. It says, Keep your lives free from the love of many, and be content with what you have, because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So what, what does that actually mean? What is Paul emphasizing there in verse 8? Many years ago, when I was in college and leading a Christian fellowship, there was a very dynamic group of students from a particular church, and they had this YTF slogan. And basically, whatever Jesus said or did on earth was true for today. Well, um, you know, this, this, this is not quite right. Let's have a look at uh, slide four, please. So, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change what he does and what he teaches. So, what he did and what he taught holds true for today. Is that true or is it false? Well, we have to test it and see. Um, and being a good mathematician, I like to test things out. And I like to sort out my variables. And the main two variables we're going to deal with today are people and time. The people that uh, the New Testament features are either Jews or Gentiles. And they may be believers or unbelievers, a Jewish believer, a Jewish unbeliever, a Gentile believer, a Gentile unbeliever. They may be a God-fearing Gentile, which are an unusual group, a very important group, or they might just be a pagan Gentile. So we have to think about the people that the Lord Jesus Christ is either talking to or talking about. And then when it comes to time, we have to put things, well, as I say, I've written this book on progressive revelation, and that notes things in chronological order. Now, if you can do a study in chronological order, it takes a bit, bit more time, energy, and effort, you will, you will notice when things change or when something new comes, comes in. And then you can stop and see that this is a significant point in time and what's going to come next. Okay, slide five, please. So, here's Matthew chapter 10, verses 5, and then 9 to 10. This is Jesus sent out the 12 with the following instructions. Do not 
get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff for the worker is worth his keep. That's what he said when he sent out the twelve. Now, after the Last Supper, just before he was betrayed, what do we read in Luke chapter 22, verses 35 to 36? Jesus refers to that um, occasion. Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse, bag or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, but now, if you have a purse, take it and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. Notice that, but now. Things have changed. The instructions he gave in Matthew 10 are being changed. And so when you had some missionaries who base their call on Matthew 10, well, oh, take nothing with you. I'm just going to go out and li live by faith. Well, they've forgotten that Jesus changed that at the end of Luke. So that's an interesting change in the teaching of Jesus, which shows that everything that he said and taught yesterday, today, and forever um, doesn't stay the same. Number six, please. So let's go back to that passage and notice what he, he said to them. Matthew 10, verses 5 to 6, These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. Well, you know, good job that was changed sometime, wasn't it? Otherwise we wouldn't be here. But anyway, let's look at that. Do not enter any town of the Samaritans. Well, later in John 4, it was a bit difficult to tie up the chronology between the John's Gospel and the synoptics but this i think came later i may be wrong so he came to a town in samaria called sicker his disciples had gone into the town to buy food just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman a samaritan woman so earlier don't go into any town of samaritans and yet he takes them into a town in samaria and he talks to a samaritan woman but Probably the biggest change comes in Acts 1 verse 8. And this is from the risen Christ who had taught them for 40 days. He taught them for three years um, before his death and resurrection. But he, the risen Christ taught them for 40 days. And he tells them, now you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So now he is saying, you must go into Samaria now. And so you see the, the Lord, when he was on earth, had one agenda. And now he's extended that agenda after he has risen from the dead. They were to go into Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Be a bit careful with that expression. Because one thing the disciples did not do is go to the ends of the earth. Why didn't they do that? probably because they didn't understand it as we might understand that expression. Earth is the Greek word G-E, which means land. And so what Jesus was telling them, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the land, which is Galilee. Because what you will find from the, from the 12, from the apostles and from other leading Jews, they didn't go. They didn't go outside, basically, uh, the land of Israel, Judea, Samaria, and Galilee. Peter's one excursion that we have read, that we read about in Galatians, ended in a bit of a disaster because he was out of his comfort zone, I think. Next slide, please. So there again, notice what we have here Matthew 10, 5 to 6. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions, do not go among the Gentiles, mm. or rather to the lost sheep of Israel. Well, that is, that is what he said. But a little later, he does actually take them outside of that land. Um, we read in um, Matthew 15, 21 to 28, 
Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon, two great big Gentile cities. Had Jews living in there and had Jewish synagogues in there. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged, send her away for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Oh. Ah, the woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she pleaded. He replied, oh, it's not right to take the dogs, the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said. In other words, she agreed with him. But even if their dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table, oh, I'm entitled to the crumbs. And Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. This is one of those um, Gentile, God-fearing Gentile women. She lived in that area amongst the Gentiles. She was a Gentile. She was a Canaanite. She probably attended the synagogue, as these God-fearing Gentiles did. They couldn't join the body of the synagogue. They probably sat at the back or behind a screen or something like that. Um, but they learned, they learned what the God of Israel was like. They heard the law being read. She knew that in the law of Moses, in the prophets, the Gentiles were entitled to certain things. And she said, ah, I'm entitled to the crown. And then you have Luke. Chapter 7, which is a very interesting one about another God-fearing Gentile. Now, this God-fearing Gentile was a Roman centurion. So what did he do? Well, verse 1, when Jesus had finished saying all this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion servant, whom his master highly valued, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders to the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our synagogue. He loves our nation and has built our synagogue. Remember the Abrahamic covenant? I will bless those who bless you. This gentle centurion I'd blessed the people of Israel by building them a synagogue. And so Jesus healed his servant. So you do get a couple of exceptions. Do not go amongst the Gentiles. Okay, let's go on to slide eight, please. Right. <clears throat> let's have a look at this again. Matthew 10, 5 to 6. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. Now, right at the end of Matthew, we have what many people call the Great Commission. Uh, it's not called that in the Bible. And what does it say in Matthew uh, 28, verse 19? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Some people see this as them being told to go out into the world, out into the Gentile world. They never did it. Um, why not? Because I don't think they understood it in that way, and I don't think that was Jesus meant. The word out, sorry, the word of, in verse 19, where he says, go and make disciples of all nations, could be equally translated, go and make disciples out of all nations. And that's, of course, that's what they did on the day of Pentecost. There were Jews gathered there on the, on the day of Pentecost from umpteen nations across the world. And they made disciples out of all many of those. We read that 3,000 were saved and were baptized. Then we read that five, number rose to 5,000. So it was a significant movement. But they were making disciples out of all nations, not of all nations. And when he says, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, remind it, he commanded them to keep the law. The Gentiles were never commanded to keep the law. 
uh, and we read in, I think it's Acts 21, at the end of Paul's third missionary journey, when he goes back to Jerusalem and says all the wonderful things that's happened in the Gentile nations, James, the Lord's half-brother, who was leader of the church of Jerusalem, he said, see how many thousands of Jews there are that have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. So this great command at the end of Matthew 28, 19, 20, is not telling the 12 to go out to the Gentiles. It's telling them, you preach to all these Jews out of all nations. And so it's the same as in Acts 1 to 8, where we've already talked about, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the land, not the earth. So God, Jesus is here trying to get these people to convert the nation of Israel. Because if they converted the nation of Israel, and if they could persuade the Jews to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior, if they were converted, they would then become a kingdom of priests, and then they would go out to the other nations. So that's that was the plan, not sending these Jews, these fishermen, these tax collectors out into the Gentile world, because many of them would have been like a fish out of water, if I can use that of fishermen. Number nine, please. Okay. So, these 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles, go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. Well, Peter had gone out on one of his tours around Judea and he gets uh, down on the coast and he's given a vision of a sheet coming down from heaven and actually containing unclean meat. Eat it. No, he said, I'm going to eat it. Eat it. Three times he was told to eat it. Then the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, go with the men. Go with the men who are knocking on your door. And these were the men from another God-fearing Gentile centurion. He was called Cornelius. Peter already had, had a good dealing with a Gentile, a Gentile centurion, one who had built the synagogue in Capernaum, and that was up near where Peter lived. Now he's going to another one, another God-fearing Gentile. And Peter went to him, um, had to learn that he was wrong. He says it is against our law for a Jew to meet with a Gentile. That word law there is not nomos, the Mosaic law. It's the word which means tradition. And it was the tradition introduced by Pharisees and people like that, that all Gentiles were unclean. Well, that's not true. What makes a person unclean is what they do. If you get blood on you, you're unclean whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. If you go with a prostitute, you're unclean, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. So God-fearing Gentiles good, lived good lives and they were not unclean, and Peter had to learn that. But, you know, Peter didn't go to any other Gentiles, and nor did any of the Twelve. They didn't. The person who was going to the Gentiles, well, we read in Acts chapter 9, verse 15, just before this incident with Cornelius, talking about Paul, this um, Jew of the dispersion. This Jew had been born in Tarsus and educated in the ways of the Gentiles before then going to Jerusalem and sitting at the feet of Gamaliel and learning all about the law. This is the man. This is the man God has chosen. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. And that's exactly what Paul was going to do on his missionary journeys. He was going to go into those synagogues and proclaim Jesus to the Jews of the dispersion. And he was going to go and speak to the God-fearing Gentiles in those synagogues. And he was going to speak to the pagan Gentiles in the marketplace or in the lecture halls or wherever he had the opportunity. And he spoke to various leaders as well. He was not treading on the toes of the 12. Their mission was to stay in Jerusalem, Judea, 
Samaria and Galilee and witness to the people there, the Jews there. And they had an ever-changing missionary field, particularly in Jerusalem. I think there were four big feasts where Jews from all different parts of the um, world would come up to Jerusalem and they could witness to them and talk to them about Jesus. And they did. Paul, on the other hand, first of all, with people like Barnabas and then with Silas, were out into the Roman Empire speaking at the, to the synagogues and Gentiles scattered throughout that empire. Number 10, please. Now, here's an interesting little change in Jesus. In Matthew 12, 8 to 16, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, warning them not to tell who he was. He would do something, they would think he was absolutely fantastic, but don't tell anyone, he would say. Matthew 16, 20, then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Wow. Mark 3, 11 to 12, you are the Son of God, but he gave them strict orders not to tell who he was. Mark 8, 30, 31, you are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Now, <clears throat> you might think, well, well, why? Why, why, why all this secrecy? Why didn't he want people to know who he was? Maybe he wanted his, um, his acts and his words to give the message rather than it being secondhand at that point in time. Remember, it said in Isaiah, when your God comes to save you, then the um, blind will see, the deaf will hear, the lame will leap, and the dumb will speak. And that's major miracles, if you like, or some of the major miracles that Jesus did. And of course, he, he says at one time, when arguing with the leaders in Jerusalem, well, if you don't believe me, believe my works, believe the signs that I am doing. But what happens a bit later? Number 11, please. Later, well, we come to what we call Palm Sunday. And then the crowd started shouting out as he rode on that donkey, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord and lots and lots of other things about him. So much so that in Luke 19 verse 30, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Look at what they're calling you. The son of David, the Messiah, you know, the king. This is, this is blasphemy. But now Jesus says, in verse 40, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Now is the time to proclaim who I am in Jerusalem. There I am in the city, in the temple, proclaiming who I am. Earlier, no, it was right that the crowds kept quiet and my words and my actions spoke for me. But now you can say who I am. Slide 12, please. 12. Uh, thanks. Mm -hmm. And then John 14, verses 13 to 14, we have we have this, in, this verse, which has really caused a lot of people problems because they take it totally out of their context. Um, remember, it, he's talking to the, well, I think Judas probably left by then, 11 and the others present at the Lord's Supper. He says to them, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Now, that was said to a very select group of people. If you take it in, in its context and apply it to everybody, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, forever. So therefore, this applies to all of us today, all Christians. You get into big trouble because it doesn't work, and it was never meant for us, right? So here's a classic example of where it doesn't work for somebody who was a great apostle, the apostle to the Gentiles. In 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 to 9, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, 
Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul did not have his prayer answered. He, he, he asked three times. So you may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Didn't work for Paul. It did not work for Paul. So I, it does not work for me. I have had some prayers answered, I will admit. I have had many, many more not answered in the way I would like uh, them to be answered. But maybe I was praying for things that uh, were not for the best. We will see. Next slide, please. Thank you. So, question. What do we learn? Well, we learn we need to pay special attention as to, one, when the Lord said something, and look to see if his teaching changed later as we progress through the gospel period and into the Acts period and beyond. Does something change? Well, yes, we have seen a couple of things change. Don't take any purse, don't take any money with you. Now take it with you. You know, you can ask anything in my name and I'll do it. Well, Paul, I, I, it didn't work for me. You know, don't go into the Samaria, into Samaria. Okay, go to the Samaritans. You know, don't go into the Gentiles. Yes, Paul, you're going to go to the Gentiles. So we see these things changing. And we should note that when Paul was called, you know, no Gentile in the book of Acts had been saved by that time. First one that was saved was the God-fearing Gentile called Cornelius. So this idea that the, that the church started at Pentecost, that the Jews were finished with when they crucified Christ and rejected him and put him on the cross, is not true. Yes, it was a great sin for them to reject Jesus, hand him over to the Romans, and to get him crucified. But remember on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And Peter, in his speech in Acts 3, tells the people tells the Jews there in Jerusalem, you acted in ignorance. And a sin committed in ignorance could be forgiven if once it was pointed out, if it was pointed out, the people repented. So that's what they were doing during the book of Acts. They were pointing out that Jesus was the Christ, what, or is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior. So we notice that we look at what something the Lord said to see if his teaching changed later as we progress through the gospel period, the Acts period and beyond. And two, we need to know who he is talking about. The Jews, the Samaritans, the Gentiles. Does he say something different about them? Well, we've already hinted at this, that uh, the Lord taught the disciples to keep the law. And during the book of the Acts, the Jewish Christians kept the law. James said, look how many thousands of Jews there are that believe, and they're all zealous for the law. But the big issue was the Gentiles. Did the Gentiles in the book of Acts, when they became Christians, were they to be circumcised? Were they to keep the law? And the answer was no, it wasn't. So you can see the differences coming out here. But we need to appreciate 2 Timothy 3.16 which is all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be completely, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So what do we learn and what can we apply to ourselves? Uh, what can we apply? Well, we can apply a lot of what the Lord said to the Jews. I mean, he emphasized the moral teaching, uh, which is very, very important. Uh, what, what's the greatest commandment? What's the greatest commandment of the law? Well, he answered with two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, I'm quite happy with that. I'm quite happy with that. I have some good neighbors, so they're not too difficult to love, actually, and help. So there we go. Next slide, please. 14. So what does Hebrews 13, 8 mean then? What is, the, what is this Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Um, what, what does that actually mean? Well, let's go back to it, and let's look at the context. Slide 15, please. Let's remember ourselves what it says. 
Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Well, all the bits I've got in, in colour, I think that's good advice, isn't it? Keep your lives free from the love of money. Well, Paul says, didn't he? Uh, the love of money is a root of all evil. And he says that in the pastoral epistles. Be content with what you have. Well, John the Baptist told the soldiers to be content with their wages. And Paul says, godliness with contentment is great gain. Um, remember your leaders. Well, yeah, we ought to remember our leaders. And the one, particularly the ones who spoke the word of God to you, the people who introduced you to Jesus, and consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So all of this is good advice. Number, 15, number 16, please. So, Hebrews 13, 5 to 8, the bits I didn't put in colour, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. So is it true today? Is it true of us that the Lord will never leave us, will never leave you? Well, yeah, it is actually. Um and he'll never forsake us, because when we believe the gospel of our salvation, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit can never leave us, nor forsake us. Christ's Holy Spirit is there inside us. Yes, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon people for a period of time to give them special abilities to do certain tasks. And when that task was over, the Holy Spirit could leave them. Or he would leave them in the case of people like Saul if they committed sin. But Jesus said the time is coming when the helper, the counselor, the Holy Spirit will be with you and in you forever. And that's true. It's true. The Lord will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. And is the Lord my helper? Well, yes, he is. But this is the interesting bit. Albeit that the help he gives may differ from people to people, may differ from person to person, may differ from time to time. Paul pleaded that this thorn in the flesh be removed. Well, God could have healed him. That would have been one way to help him. The other way to help him was to be given grace to cope with his physical problem. And that's exactly what God did. So some people he healed, some people he didn't heal in the book of Acts. And Paul is an example of someone who did not heal. And, you know, we know that there's very, very few healings like Jesus did. God may answer prayer and people may heal. But this great, instant, immediate, total, complete healing of all people that came to Jesus during the, during the Gospels. No, that, that's not around today. God can heal, yeah. And I know from my own experience, mine is a bit like Paul. When I had a serious back injury, um, and for seven weeks I was in hospital, and God's grace was sufficient for me, and I've been limited ever since with back problems, but I, I, thanks to the Lord, I get through. So in these ways, yes, in these ways, that the Lord will never forsake us, the Lord will never leave us, he is my constant helper. In that way, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Next, please. So, going back to where we started in the Anglican services, with three readings. First, the Old Testament. Second, the epistles and the letters. And the third, the Gospels. Does that matter? I think it does, actually. I think it would be much better if they read them in chronological order. Because although their desire is to exalt Jesus, which, which I totally agree with, you know, we must, not we must not forget that the Jesus who walked the earth was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It was only later after he um, was resurrected from the dead did he send them to the Samaritans. And it was only after he ascended 
and went into heaven that he sent them to the Gentiles. So we have to remember that the risen, glorified Christ is, is, well, we need to know about the Christ on the earth, but we really need to know about the risen, ascended, and glorified Christ and what he revealed. Thank you, David. Thank you.